Okay, so, uh, hello, I'm Ross, uh, and this is Taryn, and we're here to talk to you about uh, writing your own controllers and extending your Kubernetes cluster. So, yeah, I guess. Uh, that's our Twitter, if you want to follow us later, we'll, we'll link to these slides and uh, any example code that we publish uh, this afternoon. Um, so, yeah, first uh, we need to talk about Kubernetes at Cloudflare. Um, before Kubernetes, we had a bunch of ways of managing uh, processes and configuration in, in business. Uh, in code review, comments or on developer laptops, and developers don't seem to like having their laptops go to production. And email change and, and Mesos. Uh, we kind of wanted to consolidate all of these into one source of truth, which we think we can do with Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, kind of all these things together is low cohesion. Everything was spread across multiple things and highly coupling. So you needed to know about the configuration that was in all the different places to understand what the system was doing. Uh, so we want to keep it simple. We want to automate the processes as much as possible, abstract implementations. Uh, so move the decision making away from the developer teams to the teams that are in control of infrastructure and remove duplicate state so that it's easy to understand what's going on in the system. Uh, and another thing that's kind of different than many Kubernetes clusters that we've talked to people here at KubeCon about is we run all of our own physical infrastructure. Uh, so we're doing Kubernetes the salt way. Uh, it's pretty much our only option. Uh, there's no gcloud salt start Kubernetes. Uh, and so since we don't have a cloud provider, uh, we need to bridge the gap between what Kubernetes expects the cloud provider to provide and what we have on bare metal. So we built uh, a couple different services. Uh, there's no, no cloud load balancer without a cloud. Uh, so we built Leafer, which is a load balancer for bare metal. Um, hardware uh, scales at a much slower rate than what you can do in the cloud. Uh, so we built PyLi, a way to automate user control and namespace creation in RBAC so that we can share a single cluster across teams and projects. And we already have an existing telemetry and metrics platform for our previous system and also our edge network. So we built a rule loader uh, as a controller to configure Prometheus uh, to report to the current and existing telemetry pipeline. Uh, so you can't believe it's not serverless. Some guy, he, I, I've never heard of him, uh, said to fully appreciate the serverless movement functions as a service more Specifically, I had to first understand the role event-driven architectures play in modern-day computing. It's not just IoT. And that kind of brings us to what this presentation is about, which is controllers. Uh, they're pretty much event-driven responses to things that Kubernetes is doing so that you can extend your Kubernetes cluster uh, in an automated fashion. So our example problem, uh, we, as we've mentioned, want a namespace for every developer in the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, there's a couple ways that we can implement this outside of Kubernetes. We can have IT provision of namespace when people start. We can have people file tickets when they first start in the first week. They love creating tickets, it turns out. Or we can write a standalone service uh, for them to talk to and then that will provision, provision a uh, namespace for them. Or we can write a controller that can do that automatically based on uh, logging into a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and so that's what we've decided to build with, uh, within PyLi. So there's uh, four steps to writing a uh, controller. The first step is define a CRD. Uh, two is actually generate the client code so you can work with it. Uh, three is listen to events. And four is handle events in the queue. So talking about the first one, creating custom resource. Uh, it's unfortunately kind of small, um, but fairly simple YAML structure uh, that defines a uh, a new custom resource or third-party resource. Uh, and you can also uh, automatically on admission uh, make sure that this matches the uh, schema if you want, if you define one. Uh, for code generation, Kubernetes ships with a code gen tool uh, that helps them build the client code, informers, li listers, and automatic deep copying uh, support so that you can easily uh, change these objects without changing all representations of them. 
Uh, and so here we have an example type, a user type, uh, which embeds a user spec type. And we've added some comments in the Go code uh, that tell the uh, code generation tool how to generate the code. Um, then you can depend on the code gen tool and your favorite package manager for Go. Uh, and then you, once you, uh, there's a script that can set that all up and run it and will actually generate uh, the generated code for you. And that pretty much we take types and that turns it into types in ZZ generated deep copy. Uh, and similar things for listers and informers. Uh, and we're listening for events. We go over Ross. So the next part about uh, writing a controller is hooking up your business logic to events that are happening in the cluster. And um, one of the things that we realized after we had finished writing these, these four or five uh, uh, extensive, uh, ex yeah, different services that extend our Kubernetes cluster was that um, we really didn't write that much code that wasn't related to the business logic. And it came up that we might actually be able to fit all of the code that we wrote that wasn't business logic into a presentation. So that's what I'm going to try and do here um, to show you how simple it is to actually like write to just focus on your business logic. Um, because it's not actually serverless, but it is very, it feels very serverless to me. Um, so the first thing, uh, first bits of code that we need to write ourselves are uh, hooking up into the event framework um, for Kubernetes. And there's a ton of stuff that's already written for this. Um, one of the first things uh, is informers. So there's uh, a concept of informers that's written in the client Go. A uh, big shout out to all the people that work on the API machinery, because this is awesome, and it makes your life so much easier. Um, these informers let you uh, react to changes in resources in the Kubernetes cluster. Um, they've reduced the burden on the API server by uh, removing all the polling, essentially. And uh, they also do another nice thing, which is populate a read-only cache. So whenever you need to read a resource from the API server, you uh, don't incur a round trip to the API server. You essentially just um, read it from the cache that was populated efficiently by the uh, watch mechanism. So then the, uh, the next part in your arsenal is a lister. This is the read-only cache that is populated by the informer. So this is one of the tools to reduce the burden on the API server so that your uh, Kubernetes administrator doesn't tell you, no, you have to shut that off. Um, and the last bit uh, that we found to be super useful was actually the, the work queues. They're um, a really uh, simple and straightforward interface um, to implementing an asynchronous queue. Um, and some of the uh, big selling points is that these queues are stingy, uh, which means that they, uh, if you add a single item twice to the queue, it'll only be processed once. Um, and then they are fair, which means that uh, items are processed in the order in which they're added. And then they uh, support multiple consumers and producers. So um, you can, it allows a item to be requeued while something is currently processing the item. Um, so that's really uh, super useful for handling, handling errors, which we'll see in a few slides. So the first question that you uh, well, that usually comes up is what to actually put on the queue. It, it's a really free form, um, but we do have some guidelines for this. Um, we've tried it a couple of different ways, and this seems to be the best way is um, the queues uh, use Go, uh, Go map equivalents to actually determine whether or not an item is matched matches to an item that's already in the queue. So keep it as simple as possible. And the simplest uh, key that we've been able to find that works uh, reliably um, is actually just the metadata.name. Um, we've tried other things like uh, the UID, the revision and UID, um, but really um, those don't, they kind of throw away a lot of the guarantees of the queue. Um, it won't stop you from doing this, but just try not to, because the queues work way better when you're using something that doesn't change every time um, you try and process a, an item. So here's the first bit of code. Um, 
So in this code example, we um, we set up a queue. This is a rate limiting queue, um, and we set up an informer. Um, so the queue there for processing events. The informer is there for um, for getting updates. So it's really simple. These two lines essentially get you set up watching Kubernetes resources. Um, and then this function that we have defined below uh, in queue user, this is really all it takes um, to take an event from a user and actually just put it into the queue. So this cache.delete, yeah, delete handling meta namespace key func, a really long name. All that does is um, if an object is deleted, in the time uh, since the last sync period, um, and you didn't see the deletion for whatever reason, uh, due to a network failure or something like that, um, you'll get an object tombstone to, instead of an actual object. And this function um, just unpacks the object tombstone for you um, and extracts the name for you. Um, and uh, by default, it assumes that the key that you want is just the name. Um, so. Once you get the key back, um, you just do uh, q.add, and it's off um, to be processed. So um, we have to hook up the informer and that function that we just uh, showed. So it's really simple to do. An informer produces three types of events, um, creation, update, and delete. Um, and one of the weird things here is that we handle all of these things the same way. Um, so. We found this to be actually really uh, kind of empowering. It, it makes um, your function, uh, well not function, it makes uh, writing the code later on way easier. Uh, and it means that you have way less code paths to worry about. So every time we see a creation, updation, or deletion um, for an event, we always just add it to the queue to be processed. Um, and we handle the difference between deletion and, um, yeah, the difference between deletion and creation or update um, separately, um, and we found that to be like way more reliable than actually being present for the delete. Um, so in this case, you can see that we always just call the same user and queue user function from before, um, and that just takes the queue and the object that was just operated on. So the next thing, um, now that we're watching our actual user objects. Um, so yeah, now that we're actually watching the user CRD that we had before, um, we actually want to watch our children. So one of the things that we found that was confusing was that uh, you might have processed the initial creation of a user properly, where you've mapped the user to a namespace and it appears. But then if someone with permissions to goes and deletes the namespace, it may take uh, well, up to your resync period before the namespace comes back. And um, that was confusing and a little bit uh, strange to users. So um, the way that we've gotten around this is by uh, triggering updates, reprocessing the user every time one of the children is updated as well. So Kubernetes has a um, metadata owner references field um, in every object. And this is essentially just a list of every Kubernetes object, or yeah, object that can, is considered to be a parent of the other object. So in the Kubernetes namespace, we set the uh, owner references to be the um, user. And then what we do is we just watch for events on all of the namespaces. And if that namespace has an owner reference to a user, we add that user to the queue. Um, so that means that if someone deletes or mucks around with a, uh, a namespace that's owned by one of our things, we have the chance to immediately go back out and fix it and make sure that it's not broken. So that's the input side of the queue. Um, we're listening for um, events from both the parent and the child in this relationship. Um, and we're adding the item to the queue based on the name of the parent. Um, and now we actually need to go out and edit, or actually go out and do the work. So we have, we use a, a, a pattern here of worker go routines. Um, so we can process multiple items at the same time. So what each worker go routine does is it just sits in a loop of popping items off of the queue. 
and then calling a work function. Um, and it, one of the things that it does is it, it, it'll never block forever on one item. Because if you take forever on 10 items or so, and you only have 10 go routines, then you stop processing good items. So um, we make a point of avoiding that situation altogether by timing out work functions. So then a work function in this model, it needs to handle deletion, since we didn't do that earlier. And it also needs to be idempotent, because um, since we watch our children resources, if there's a potential for a loop here, if you update the child and then add, uh, go back to processing the item again and then update the child again and then go back to processing the item again, it'll never end. Um, so it's really important that if there's no work to be done, the work function doesn't do any work, um, which is easy. It, it's potentially uh, problematic sometimes. Um, so the first part we have here is this process work item. This is essentially the same thing across every single one of these uh, that we've written. Um, we should open source this. Um, it is uh, a function which um, you call once, and it processes an item from the queue. Um, if it returns true, then you call it again. If it returns false, you don't call it again. So you just do for process work item and sit forever in your Go routine. But this function, uh, it does a little bit of work. Um, it, the first thing it does is it gets the item from the queue. Um, and when you get an item from the queue, you get both the key and uh, a indication of whether or not the queue is shutting down. So if the queue is shutting down, then we just don't do anything here and return false. This means that this Go routine uh, will exit. So uh, your controller, when it's told to exit, exits cleanly and doesn't need Kubernetes to like sig kill it at some point. Um, and then the next thing that it does is it defers uh, queue.done. And this essentially just tells the queue that we are done processing the item um, and that it can put it back into the queue in a way where other processing items can, or other processors can operate on the item. Um, so no matter what, or no matter whether it's a success or a failure, you still uh, need to indicate that you're done. And then um, the next important bit is um, this we call the work function here. So if you remember, it's idempotent and it handles deletes. So really, it's really simple in this sort of uh, Go routine code. All you do is call the work function um, and return an error, uh, capture the error. If there's an error, well, then we didn't succeed. So we need to add the queue back, or add the item back to the queue uh, at a later time. And the actual, the work queue functions do this for you. They have this um, add rate limited key, which will mean that um, you're, you won't sit in a hot loop trying something that's failing over and over and over again. It'll, uh, it'll essentially um, back off uh, up to a certain point. And you can tweak the settings here. Uh, we just use the defaults, so they seem to work pretty well. So if you have an error, though, um, or if you don't have an error, you have to tell the queue that it was successful. So you do queue.forget, and that means that the queue, um, if it hasn't already been re-added, will just forget that the item was in the queue in the first place um, when you call done. So in the happy path, you have to call queue.forget. It doesn't seem, it's a weird function name, but it's uh, absolutely required. So that, those slides of code, that's pretty much it. You. Those are really only the only functions and the only code that you need to write that isn't business logic code. Um, it was kind of really surprising to us that we were able to write so little code and essentially have um, like event-driven code that's resilient, that handles failures, um, and that is fast and doesn't use a polling mechanism. Um, so. But there are a few more tips and tricks uh, for this. So one of the things that you may have noticed is that I never actually handled an error um, in those codes, in that code. Um, and that doesn't just extend to the, um, the generic code. That actually extends into um, the actual work function. So one of the things that we 
we, we started out doing was handling our errors and retrying and um, trying to do all this fancy like diff and fetch the object again and make sure that you had a proper revision. Um, and then we just decided to, you know what, let's not even worry about it. If we get an error anytime, just return it. Um, you don't panic and you don't make sure that you catch the error, um, but just return it and let the queue retry them. So it's actually really incredible. Um, it makes all of our if statements for errors really simple on one line. Um, it also reduces like dramatically. There's like three or four times reduction in code size by just not handling the errors um, and just letting the queue retry them. So another thing that we struggled on for a little while, um, which I would like to hopefully help you avoid, is handling deletes. Um, essentially, don't um, if you don't have to. So um, if you have the two questions that I ask uh, whenever we're writing a new controller is, do you have external state? And uh, do you need to guarantee that you witness a deletion? Like, are you keeping track of it? state, really. Just two ways of asking the same question. Sometimes you get different answers, though. Um, so if you have, uh, well, I guess, don't handle on delete differently, which is the first part. So um, if you handle on delete code differently, you're essentially duplicating your deletion code in two different places, because um, it's still possible that um, even if you've received an update or a create or a refresh, that by the time you go to process it, the thing will have been deleted. So you're going to have to handle the deletion in the worker code anyway. So just skip that whole thing and then check uh, in your worker code to, be, to see if the, a deletion is necessary, um, if you need to handle deletes. If you don't need to handle deletes, then just use the Kubernetes garbage collection. Um, so earlier, we said, talked about building the parent-child relationship. If you've done this, you essentially get garbage collection for free. Um, the garbage collector will delete objects that once had an owner, but no longer have an owner. So if you've set up that owner relationship to your parent resource, then when the parent resource is deleted, which is when you would be handling the delete, uh, Kubernetes will go around and uh, delete any child resources for you. So this way, you don't actually have to write any code at all to handle deletion. Kubernetes will do it for you. So no code is uh, best. I think you've all seen uh, Kelsey Hightower's um, framework. No code is definitely better than code. Uh, so it's essentially free. But unfortunately, if you answered yes to either of those questions, you should use finalizers for deletion. So. Um, what this means is that you don't rely on watching or being present at the time that the deletion event is fired, because you might miss that. Um, and instead, you use a, uh, a finalizer list, which is present in any Kubernetes object uh, that uses the API metadata. Um, so in reality, um, what a finalizer does is that when you delete a resource, Kubernetes sets the object as having a deletion timestamp, and then will prevent any other things from actually updating the, the object um, and adding more finalizers to the list. And then once the list of finalizers is empty, uh, the resource will be removed from the cluster um, automatically. So, um, so I guess this is the same thing that I just said. Um, waits for each finalizer to complete before removing the resource. So this way, you don't have to be present for the deletion to actually go out and clean up your external state. You can tell Kubernetes to wait for you to be done. Um, this means that you can run, uh, you can handle restarts without worrying about missing the delete. Um, because if your service starts back up in time, then you can still process the delete, even if you weren't running at the time that someone deleted the parent resource. So. This is an example of the worker function. We have a whole bunch of arguments here because these are the things that we interact with. Um, but essentially, if we have, um, what we do is we have essentially an if statement is one of the first things in this worker function that checks to see if the deletion timestamp is zero and if uh, the 
finalizers list has our finalizer in it. So if that's true, that means that the object is deleted and we haven't yet done the work that we need to do. So we need to handle the delete. So this is different from depending on whatever your business's needs are. Um, so I don't have any code here for it. But at the end, what you do is you need to remove example.com from your, or whatever your finalizer's name is called, from the list of finalizers, uh, and then return. If neither of these are true, that means you have nothing to do. Either the object, well, yeah, if, uh, if neither of them are true, then you just continue on with the happy path of actually creating and updating the resource. Um, and then, uh, yeah, actually doing the work. So thank you. This is actually all that we have. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes, in the front, down in front. OK, uh, the question was, tell us more about Leafer. OK, so Leafer is our, since we run on bare metal, we have um, no cloud load balancer. So Leafer is our approach at doing load balancer service IPs. And it works. Um, it's, it's very similar to Metal LB from Google, except for it makes no um, sort of assumptions at all about your networking environment. And it, um, you can plug it into whatever you want. If you have like a network team that wants to own the network, then you can just let them configure it. Um, but it'll do the Kubernetes side of load balancer IP. So it should work really well with Minikube. And we're kind of working right now and making it more available to people outside of Cloudflare. So yes. Hi, uh, nice talk. Um, do finalizers exist for uh, things that are created? So for an object being created instead of things that are being deleted? Do finalizers? Yes. So um, starters, I guess. For what? Sorry? Starters rather than finalizers. Finalizers is a bad term. Yes, they do. Oh. Um, and they are called initializers. Okay. okay. Yes. So um, there are, yeah, they have some fun quirks, but they are there. Um, but one of the things to be to be wary of with a with an initializer is that you can't delete an object that hasn't finished initialization yet, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, confusing a mm -hmm. little bit. Yeah. But uh, yes, they do exist. Um, I think they've existed for longer than finalizers even. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Of course. Any other questions? Oh. Um, so I'm being told we have t-shirts if you want a Cloudflare t-shirt. They're down in the front in boxes, free. <laughs> 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 All right, thank you. Thanks.